like, this is crazy. This is awesome. I've never been a part of something like this. And I said, neither have I. It's an honor. It's an honor to be a part of a God movement like what God is doing at Discovery. Funny enough, we, we started Discovery wanting to be and believing to, that, that God had the vision for us to be a church planting church. So we got three churches in three years now since we have been uh, in existence, since we've launched the church, and, and uh, one that we've been praying about um, for a while now, God has just orchestrated beautifully for this to happen, is Discovery India, happening right here in Bakersfield. I want to introduce you, Pastor Chaco, our, our pastor to Discovery India. They'll be meeting at the Mission Center at our, our old campus. Amen. Bakersfield in January, and he wasn't, it was just a God thing, he wasn't even supposed to come to Bakersfield, he was supposed to somewhere else, but God had just orchestrated it differently, met up with him uh, through Global AIM, our mission partnership, Global AIM is Asian Indian Ministries, that's what AIM stands for, and so, man, we've been connected since then, and just we've been putting things in order, and believing now that this is the right step, right season, this week, actually on Thursday, May 11th, we're doing a miracle and healing service for the Indian and Punjabi community that Pastor Chaco and a guest uh, pastor from India that we're bringing in is going to do this. So we're just believing that, hey guys, the mission field is coming to Bakersfield, okay? We have, we have a mission field here. And so this is our third language. We've got English, Spanish, um, Indian, Hindi, Punjabi. There's like so many dialects, but, but uh, with, this, with the Indian community. But um, hey, you guys, heaven and hell are real. So as long as, as long as there are people that are lost and on their way to hell, we need to be busy about the Father's work. And, and no matter who they are in Bakersfield, okay, we're going to reach Bakersfield for Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Hallelujah. Pastor Chaco, we can introduce yourself to your church, man. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Jason. You Thank you. Thank you, Discovery Church. It is a very uh, wonderful, amazing church. So, I was a pastor and a missionary for the last 15 years in India, God miraculously brought me here in Bakersfield. And uh, immediately we got connected with the Discovery Church. And it was a wonderful church. It is amazing to be with Pastor Jason and the team. And uh, we got to know that there are near about 15,000 families here in Indian community in Bakersfield. Yeah. So here is a mission field. So I am excited to be part of this church and with uh, your prayer and God's help we will be able to make a difference here in Bakersfield. Amen. Come on, guys. Praise God. Help me. Come on. Stretch your hands. Stretch your faith. Let's pray for Pastor Chop and the calling and the mission that God has given him. God, I thank you for the calling that you have given Chaco that all of the experiences even the good, the bad, every experiences that has led to this day, I believe we're in preparation for a time such as this, God, that you have given him everything he needs to accomplish your will, your purpose, and your mission here in Bakersfield to reach the Indian community. So, God, I pray for an increased anointing over his life, that you would go before him with signs and wonders, God, and that this community would know that there is one true real and awesome God who is a living God and still works today. Thank you for making a way. I pray for the team that's being built as we speak to reach this community. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Come on, give it up for Pastor Chaco. Amen. Amen. So right now, we're building that launch team. They're meeting in the home. Soon, they're going to be at our Mission Center campus on Shirab. We'll let you know all about that. And there's more on the horizon, too. We're we're, we're planning like two more campuses, all right? And, and, and so when, probably this summer, I'm going to bring before you and stretch you some more, church. I'm going to stretch your faith a little bit more. And, and, and I say that now, though, and we, we talk about this routinely because we just need to prepare. We need to position ourselves for where God wants us to be. So that means, that means we need to have leaders in the pipeline. We need, we need more children's pastors and youth pastors and leaders and worship teams and and we, we need, because we're, we're ascending church, okay? We're not, a, we're not a just an occupied church. No, no, we're, we're ascending church. We believe that's one of our, our premier responsibilities in Collins at Discovery is to launch churches. Amen. 
Amen. I hope you're excited about it just as much as I am. Amen. 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 All right. Man, I'm excited about this series, too, this Galatians series. I, I really love digging into the, the, this book with you. And it's a little change of pace because we usually go topical, which I love teaching topical. It's really how Jesus taught really topically. And, and I'm not saying there's any style, but Jesus did it, okay? But anyway, uh, but this uh, we change it up a little bit and go uh, with, the, with the book. And, and we, we picked Galatians because this is such a foundational, um, doctrinal, I mean, the whole book is, is given so that to, to give you a, sh a sure foundation on the doctrine of Jesus Christ and this gospel of grace that is new um, to everybody, really. New to, new to the Gentiles who were not part of the Jewish community, but it's new to the Jews who have this Old Testament law. And here comes this new gospel, this, this Jesus faith, this Christianity. And so... Uh, let me give you just up to speed really quick if you, if you miss any of those services. You really ought to catch number one, though. If you didn't miss that, please go watch part one. If there ever was a foundational teaching at Discovery, that is, that's it. Okay, because in part one, um, Paul is, is, starts this letter to, the, to Galatians. And it's, it, the letter is called Galatians because it's written to that, the churches in Galatia. And these are churches that Paul started. Paul is an apostle, which is a bit, just another term for church planter. So what he would do is... He would go into these Gentile, meaning non-Jewish cities. This is like a modern-day Turkey area. And he would preach the gospel, win people to the Lord, and then, and then raise up leaders, and, and then go do it again. So this is what he did. He'd just go and repeat. That was his, that was his call. And so what, what he did in this situation in Galatia, after he raised leaders and left some of the Jewish Christians who were new believers. I mean, they loved God. They were just new. They didn't know any better. But they had grown up with this Old Testament law, and so they thought, you still need to obey that stuff. Just because Jesus came, and he brought this grace gospel, and, this, and, and it doesn't mean you can't, you, can't, you can't get rid of this stuff. So they were confused. It was, just, it was new in the Christian faith. And so they came behind Paul to these Gentile believers that had no idea of the Ten Commandments. Namely, what they were really pushing there is, the, is circumcision. So these, these Jewish Christians came to the Galatian church and said, hey, man, that's great that you received Jesus, but you're not doing everything you're supposed to do. There's more that you guys don't know about. There's this whole Old Testament thing. There's this circumcision thing, and, and you need to start. And, and the Galatian church didn't know any better, so they just started buying into it. They just, okay, well, okay, do we need to do more? Because they love Jesus. Okay, what do I need to do for Jesus now? And so they bought into this, what Paul says, a different gospel. So that was part one of this series, where, where Paul, very beginning of the letter, he said, I can't believe, Galatian Church, I can't believe that you're, you're turning from the true gospel that you received to a different gospel. And the gospel that he's talking about, the difference is, is relationship, is what we talked about, relationship versus religion. And religion is our attempt to try to get to God. It's our attempt to fix ourselves up or improve ourselves or to do, perform, please God. So it's just our attempt we need to do in order to get God or to get to heaven. That's religion. But Christianity is not a religion in that term. It is a relationship Amen. with Jesus. Amen. It is a relationship with a person of Christ. And through that relationship, we are set free. Amen. We, are, we are saved. And so Paul is just kind of explaining this out. And what I did in part one was kind of took us back to the very beginning. Because this whole religion versus relationship thing goes to the very beginning of, of, of you know, our existence in, in Genesis. So you look at Genesis chapter 2, 3. It talks about the tree, the garden of eating the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life. And in this, in, in the garden, the the depth, the original sin of Adam and Eve, you guys, was not, a lot of people think, oh, it was the, the original sin was like, well, they were, they followed his sin. It was just like the devil duped them, they, was, they, they, they chose rebellion, or we think of sin like some sort of temptation type thing, and they just, they fell away, they fell into sin. But the original sin was not that type of sin you're thinking of. The original sin, that when the devil came and and it came in that form of the servant to Eve and said, hey, did God really say not to eat that? Are you sure? Um, uh, what? No, no, he just, he just, no, that's not true. That's not true what God said. He just, if you eat this tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he said, you will be like God. So, so the devil did not appeal to their rebellious state or their sin nature. The devil appealed to their desire to be God. See, the original sin was not the sin you're thinking of. The original sin was religion. That's the original sin. And a lot of people think that the enemy is out here trying to trip you up. No, the enemy is alive in the church trying to get you to buy in to a different 
gospel that it has to do with you performing, being good enough, doing enough God's approval, love, forgiveness, whatever. That's a different gospel. That's the different tree of knowledge of good and evil that you think you can be made godly by your own knowledge and your own wisdom. That's the different gospel. And here is this picture of a relationship, the tree of life, where God just desired you to live with Him, to have life. Amen. The relationship we're going to talk yeah. about, Paul says, this for freedom that God set you free. That's right. Now, that's the life. He said, He just, He wanted you, He has to have life because He loves you. Amen. That's why. Like, just because He. He loves you. That, that was part one. Part two, we talked about how you kind of stay in the right tree because we tend to swing tree to tree, right? We tend to do the Tarzan thing where we're in this whole, we get into a religious flow. Every one of us do it. We, try, we, we, we just kind of start to be judgmental or critical of others, of ourselves. We start doing things out of duty, not out of delight. Like, oh, I'm not too, I guess I'm not. That's the wrong tree. We get into this religious flow instead of this life freedom. Flow. So we talked about how do we quit swinging back and forth, and the answer is living the crucified life. Amen. The answer is dying to yourself and all right. nature and being resurrected like every day, every day, giving your life again and surrendering your life to Jesus Christ, living the crucified life. So today now, we're picking up in chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, uh, Paul just kind of interrupts the whole discussion. And he, like, he, he goes, let me just, I need to pause. This is Paul. Paul, Paul in chapter 3 says, let me just pause and make sure you understand the gospel of grace. Like, this is like, let me pause. And Paul now, chapter 3, picks it up in verse 1. And he says, oh, you foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? And I'm not sure if that's like the perfect translation of that word. Because in the Greek, the Greek word is baskeano, baskeano. And, and, it, and it, it literally means the evil eye. Is what it means. So, so like, have, have you, did your parents ever, like, give you the evil eye? Do you know what I'm talking about? Come on, some of you parents, you give the kids the evil eye. I give my kids a mean evil eye. Man. They know. They know when dad is serious, you know. It's that, it's that look like, when no one else is around, I'm going to kill you. That's, you're going to die. That's the look. Like, it's like. Oh, it's the evil eye. Have you ever been in, in, so Paul is saying, like, there are some people in, in church even that'll, that'll just, like, give you the, like, the, the whole look, right? Like, oh, my goodness, can you believe what she, oh, what she wearing today? Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's just, I'm telling you, so the best definition, I think, or the best, like, translation of this word would probably be those who, like, turn up their nose at you. And, and, and kind of just turn up their nose and, and, and judge you because, because you're not doing it right. I can't believe they are. Okay, and, and this is religion at its height, is what he's talking about right here. So watch what Paul says next. He kind of said, so let me tell you what you need to protect yourself from that evil eye. He said, for the meaning of Jesus Christ's death. So he goes, hey guys, look, you're, you guys obviously don't know the meaning. You don't know the meaning of Jesus' death and what it's all about, which is what today's message is all about. The meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. So let me ask you a question, Paul says. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? So, so did your life get better and did it, did it produce change inside of you because you were obeying all those rules and laws? And the answer is just, no, of course it didn't. And he, this is what he says in the next verse. Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed. The message you heard about Christ, which is, I'm going to explain to you today, the message of Jesus Christ. Because Christians have been in church their whole lives, and they still don't know it. And it's also easy to forget. It's like, it's like we did know it, we bought into it at one time, but then we forget it, and we start living a different gospel. How foolish can you be after starting your Christian lives in the Spirit? Why are you now trying to become perfect? And here's the opposite of the true Christian life. Why are you trying to become perfect? By own human effort. Why are you trying to do it yourself, thinking you're strong enough? Thinking that that's why those who give you the evil eye, they kind of put their nose up at you, they judge you, because they, they do that because they think their human effort is better than yours. Amen. And so they judge you, and they basically intimidate you, thinking, oh, I, well, I guess I need to do something. I need to do that. Well, I need to, maybe I should. And I want to pause for just a moment right here and, and Make sure you understand this gospel of grace. Like I 
it's important. It's important that we understand this grace gospel. This, this is what Paul is doing right here. He's just like, so, so let me kind of let me just pause and just kind of explain this. Okay? Because um, we were pretty much in a very, we were in a bad condition, you guys. We were in a very bad place. Our sin and our sin nature had separated us from God. We, we, the Bible said that in, in Romans chapter 3, you know, write that down, you know, to here's Romans chapter 3, 23, says that, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, meaning, meaning that, that we, um, we cannot get by our own goodness into God's presence. That's what it means, God, His glory. Like, we, we couldn't get there. Let me put it another way. Like, God can't even be in the same room as your sin. He can't. We've fallen short of the glory of God. And, and, and so we are all, the Bible says we're all sinners. And, that, and by the way, that's not because we committed a lot of sin. It's, it's one sin makes you a sinner. Amen. Just one sin. Amen. One sin defiles. It's like, it's like murder. You commit murder, and what are you? You're a murderer. You don't need to commit a whole bunch of murders to be a murderer. You just got to commit one murder, and you're a murderer. It's the same thing with sin. One sin causes the defiolation of our soul. Amen. Our Hallelujah. We, we are. That's that. And so you see the dilemma because God created you to have fellowship, to have a relationship with you. Like that's why he created you. He didn't need servants. He already had the angels. The angels were servants. God created you to have a relationship with you. And that's why God just doesn't want to be your God, this deity that you to, you just kind of respect and bow and be reverent. Understandably, that is part of his nature. But he just doesn't want to be God. He wants to be your father. Amen. Hallelujah. He wants sons and daughters. That's why he created you, to have a relationship with him. So here is our dilemma and God's dilemma. Our sin nature has caused a separation from God. And the only way that the price, the wages, the Bible says, the, the penalty, or the way I like to say, the bill for that sin is death. Amen. Eternal death, like an eternal separation from God. So here's the catch-22. Okay, if I, I need to get to God, God wants me to be with Him, so in order to get to Him, I need to die, but if I die, I can't be with God. I'll be in hell. That's the death, eternal separation. I'm just trying to explain the gospel to you guys, okay? So let me, just, just bear with me. That's the dilemma. And so, and so, what God did is he didn't wait for you to become right or get yourself right or pay for your own sins. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your death. He paid your bill. He paid it. He paid it in full. And it wasn't based on what you do or what you don't do or how much you perform. He paid it fully because he loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. So, so I like to say that God, is not, God does not send anybody to hell. God doesn't send... Hell is a place for people to go to if they want to pay for their own sins. Amen. If they like to. Amen. They can do that if they like. But they don't have to and you don't have to because they're already paid for. Amen. And all you have to do is accept that payment in Christ through grace in faith. That's the gospel of grace. And that's good news. And so then it becomes ridiculous. Doesn't it? For us to, to now, after receiving this grace, this unmerited, undeserved, unperformed favor and love and forgiveness from God, doesn't it now become understanding that ridiculous for us to go, okay, now I need to perform and do something and get God's uh, favor and, and get God's God's love and, and get God, you know, get to bless me. Does that now become ridiculous in light of His grace? Watch what it says in Galatians 3, verse 10. Paul says, all who rely on observing the law, like trying to perform, watch this, it's so huge, are under a curse. So that's not God going, I curse you, you try to obey the law, you curse then if you, obey. no, God isn't cursing you, we're cursing ourselves. Why? Check it out. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue. Cursed is everyone who can't keep it up, who can't keep doing it. Doing what? Everything. Everything written. Everything. Every command written in the book of the law, which is completely impossible. So let me say it this way. If you can't fulfill them all, you're cursed. Because it only takes one. They're separated eternally. It's impossible. In fact, James says it this way. James 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So what do we learn from this? I want you to 
jot this down, because I want to make sure you get this. This is important. Jot this down. The law couldn't be obeyed. It couldn't. It couldn't be obeyed. It still can't be obeyed. So let me put it in today's language, not just the Ten Commandments. So if you uh, pray a lot, you read the Bible a lot, you go to church a lot, you serve a lot, give a lot, like all you can do is not enough. It's not enough. And, and listen, none of these things... None of these things that we try to do has the power to cure sin. None of it has the power to do that. So the law couldn't be obeyed, therefore the law cannot cure you. It can't change your sin nature. And we ought to think that if I do something wrong, I can make it up by doing something right. Amen. That's the error of our logic, really. I mean, it's, it's what I call the 51% gospel, or the 51% heaven, right? It's, so so every, people live their life this way. If I can just be like 51% of my life good, and I can have 49% bad. If I just tip the scale a little bit, just have 51% good, I can go into heaven with that 51% and say, God, okay, I was at least 51%. you got to let me into heaven now, right, God? No, that's not right. That's not it at all. It only takes 1%. That's right, amen. It takes one sin. Amen. One sin. you got to understand this. So Paul asked the question then in verse 19, what then was the purpose of the law, man? Why would you give it, God? Like, if it can't... If it don't have the power, if it can't be obeyed, it can't hear me, why? It's a good question, isn't it? So why, God, did you give the law? And here's, here's the answer. He's going to tell it to us, but the answer is he wanted to create a frustration inside of you that you can't do it by yourself, and you would have to look to help. Amen. You have to. That's, that's why. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 and 25. So the law was put in charge for a season to lead us to Christ. That we might be justified, not by what we can do, but by faith. Now that faith has come, look at, we're no longer under the supervision of the law. In other words, it doesn't tell us what to do anymore. Something changed on the inside that gives me to do. So write it down this way. I want you to understand the gospel, you guys. Write it down. The law leads us to Christ. The law leads us to Christ, because you're not going to be able to do it. And I dedicate this message to anyone who's out there who's trying to please God by going to church more, praying more, reading more, doing more, just trying to be better, doing better, doing more. And you end up just for a season doing that, and then you end up just at this frustrated place again in your life because nothing really changed on the inside. Well, what happened? You did it wrong. You did it wrong. You weren't supposed to go to the things. You weren't supposed to try more things and do more things. You were supposed to go to the person of Jesus Christ, Amen. who by His grace right. can change you, That's can right. transform you. Hallelujah. And so many of us, we constantly do it wrong. And here's what's so cool, you guys, the coolest thing, because when that happens, when you go to the person of Christ, instead of trying to perform or do, when you go to the person of Jesus Christ, a miracle happens. Amen. Call it a miracle. Christ. It is a miracle that happens when when you when you because a lot a lot of us think we can train ourselves to be godly. Like I can train myself to be godly and to be better, and you can't. It's only through receiving what Jesus did by grace can you be changed. And the miracle happens. One verse says that if any man is in Christ, like if anyone is in the person, has a relation in Christ, a relationship with the person of Jesus Himself, he becomes a new creation. It's a miracle. It's the miracle of grace. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. That's what happens. Which means Christianity is not learned behavior. Christianity is transformation. That was a better spot. Amen. Amen. Say it again. Christianity is not learned behavior. Christianity is transformation. It's a miracle, you guys. And that's why the same verse, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, Paul says, the law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right. And I want you to catch that. We could be made right. You see, Christianity doesn't ask you to do right. It wants to make you right. That's right, amen. Okay, God doesn't ask you, hey, dude, you better do right. No, no, God wants to make you right. Man, I want you to hear that with God through faith. That's why it's so critical. You don't understand what grace is all about. This act of 
God that gives us all of this freedom, this grace. And when you understand it, when you receive it, when you experience it, you guys, a miracle takes place. And so my job, my job as your pastor is not to train you on good behavior. Like, that would be so hard. I had to come up here every week and try to train you how to have good behavior. I mean, that's, that's, so I would have to come up here, no, don't, 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 stop, stop it, stop it, don't, 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 and come back next week so I can tell you again, stop it, stop it, don't, no, that's not, that's not, some of you went to that church, right, where the pastor had this finger that reached to the back row, pointing at your chest, you know what I'm saying, it's like, my goodness, like, I don't want to come back, can we put 10 days between Sunday, please, I just, why, why do we feel that way, because it's not the gospel, Amen. and it's not the grace of God, it's not the grace. It's, it's, it's not. That's not the gospel. I need you to experience grace. I, I want you to experience Jesus in a, in a whole new way that's liberating, that is free, that is, that I'm telling you, once you've tasted of this, it will bring transformation to your life on the inside. And, and just not to experience it, but, but what I want to teach you today is how to live in grace. Amen. Not to just experience his presence and experience the grace of God, but how do we live in this grace? How do we remain in this free expression of relationship with God? There are five things that I want to give you today that grace enables, that grace gives, that, that only through grace is provided. Every one of these things, every one of these five things, listen, all of us, all of us need these five things. Every single one of us crave desire, and are looking for these five things. It's just some of us here are looking for them in the wrong places. We're looking for it in people. We're looking for it in ourselves. We're looking for it in things. Some of us may be looking for some of this stuff in substances. But it'll never satisfy. It's only through the grace of God can you get with your heart yearns for today. Amen. I believe that every yeah. single one of these little the Lord told me this, that every one of these things, every five, one of them, at least one of them, is what you're looking for today. Amen. It's what you need. And only the grace of God can supply it. It's only through grace that you can't do anything. You cannot perform. You can't get it. It's only through a relationship with Christ, through the grace that He offers, can you get what your heart needs today. Can I teach you how to live in grace? Yeah. Let me give it to you. Here's, here's the first, the first uh, point I have here. How to live in grace. Because of grace, grace says this, I am acceptable. I am acceptable. That's a pretty good place to start with because most of us spend our entire life trying to be accepted by others. We try to earn the acceptance of our parents, of our, of our peers, of our enemies, of people we envy. We try to earn the acceptance of total strangers even. We want to be accepted. So, and a lot of people, they don't I don't think we understand, we realize how much the, the desire to be accepted by others drives and influences our behavior and our actions. For a lot of us, it's the reason why you drive the car you drive. It's the reason why you have the house you have, why you dress the way you dress, why you talk the way you talk. It's the need to be accepted by other people. You ever been, like when you were a kid, who do the crazy, craziest things just to be accepted? Like, like kids on the playground, when they dared you. Remember when they dared you to do something? You know, it was just totally stupid. You did it anyway. Why? Because you want to fit in. You wanted to be accepted. And some of us even think, like, like, if I can be perfect, if I can just act right, do right, fit in enough, just, just maybe they'll accept me now if I can be perfect. Wrong. Wrong. Yes, it, just, you know why? Because Jesus was perfect. And they didn't accept him. The Bible says that he was despised and rejected among men. Jesus tells us this issue is settled when we accept his grace. Romans chapter 15, verse 7 says, Christ has accepted you. Notice there's no condition. It's not, it doesn't say Christ will accept you if you go to church every week. Or that Christ will accept you. If you promise to be perfect, if you keep the Ten Commandments, no, it's unconditional and it's based on God's grace, not your performance. Amen. Hallelujah. A lot of you have accepted Jesus Christ in your heart. You've asked, you said, Jesus, you know, I need your grace. Forgive me. And, you, and you've made him the Lord of your life. But, and you've accepted him. But you, have you ever thought that God has accepted you? No conditions, just the way 
you are because of His grace. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, You have been chosen by God Himself. Because of his grace. Amen. And that does something to your self esteem. You are chosen for something, right? When you get chosen for a promotion, when you get chosen by someone, doesn't that do something to your self esteem? Man, Brock and Hannah chose me. That does something to me because you don't know what I beat out, you guys, man. I got chosen by Veronica and Hannah to be her husband. You are chosen by God. You are chosen by God. You're acceptable by his grace. Not because you deserve it, but by His grace Amen. towards you. And a lot Amen. of us can't understand His grace. It's hard for us to understand this, this grace of acceptance. Not based on our, on our performance, because, because maybe we, we, we have human experiences where, where that wasn't the case. Where we were not accepted. Maybe the one person in your life that was supposed to accept you. Maybe it was a parent that was supposed to accept you. And they rejected you. They left you, abandoned you, abused you. Maybe it was someone that had an altar that said, to death do I part. And then the one person that bowed before God that they would accept you, rejected you. And now you have this hurt in your heart. You have this, this can't believe it type of attitude. This is your verse. Psalm 27, verse 10. Even if my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will receive me. God says, I accept you. And if God accepts you, if God accepts me and you don't, that's your problem, all right? Because God, my God accepts me. He doesn't just leave it there. God just doesn't leave it there. But because of God's grace, number two, I am valuable. I'm valuable. That's what God's grace says. It makes you valuable. I'm worth something. How much do you think you're worth? I wear often because I don't play basketball as much as I used to, but I got some basketball sneakers. If I have the same basketball sneakers that Kobe Bryant played in and I played in mine, how much do you think will sell more? It's the same sneaker, Foot Locker, okay? Kobe's right. Is it worth more? Why? Because he owned it. How about, how about if I got the same car as Lady Gaga, which I will never be able to, I don't know what she's driving, but I will never be able, whatever she's driving, I probably will never be able to afford Lady Gaga's car. But if our cars were put up against each other, who do you think is worth more? <laughs> Lady Gaga, she owned because because she owned it. Okay? Or what about the president's desk and my desk? Which one are you willing to pay more for? The president's desk. Because ownership determines value. Who, who are you owned by? 1 John chapter 4, 4 says, You belong to God. Imagine your value, you guys, when you come to Christ and say, Jesus Christ. I need you. I accept your grace and your gift of salvation. And you step across that line and God puts you in this family. All of a sudden, you now belong to God. And listen, not everyone is created by God, but not everyone belongs to God. Okay? It's only those who accept the grace of God through Jesus Christ that belong to God. God, I receive your grace. And if you've done that, you belong to God. That means, listen, you are priceless. You are valuable. The other thing that determines value is what somebody's willing to pay for. <coughs> How much was paid for you? First Corinthians chapter 7 tells us that you have been bought and paid for by Christ. In other words, he, he, he owns your life. Like he, he, his own life, he gave for you. By, the, by, by his shed blood. So you belong to him. It's the greatest ransom ever paid in all of history with Jesus Christ paid for your sins. You were bought and paid for for the price. God exchanged his very own son for your freedom. That's how much. That's how valuable you are. Isaiah 43, 4 says, God says, you are precious to me. See, by grace, maybe you're looking for this. You're looking for value in somebody else. You're looking for value in the things of this life. But the only place that can give you the value that you need is in the grace of God. God says you are acceptable because of my grace. You are valuable because of my grace. And here's the third thing that the, the healing grace of God tells us. That I am lovable. I am lovable. And this one feels so good, especially if you have a broken heart today. When you've been rejected and you don't feel too lovable. When somebody has rejected you, a, go a girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, parent, whatever, you don't feel very lovable. You feel, feel like a screw-up. Like, man, I'm just, I'm worthless. No one, no one is ever going to love me. I'm not loved by anybody. You could not be more wrong. The Bible says, the mountains and hills may crumble, 
but my love, God says, for you will never end. He says the Lord loves you. God's love will never end. There are two characteristics of God's love that you need to know about. It's different from man's love. It's different than the love that you experience on this earth from the human, from humans. We get it wrong because we compare the love of God to the humans that we do life with. There's two differences. One, God's love is consistent. It Amen. never ends. Amen. Hallelujah. You'll never have to wonder, does God love me today? That's right. You'll never have to wonder when you come into church, is God mad at me? He's going to accept me. Should I come? You'll never have to wonder, is God, does God still love me because of what I did? And, and we get this so mixed up because we experience inconsistent love. That's right. We, we experience unpredictable on, love. One lady said, growing up from day to day, I never knew whether I'd be hugged or slugged, depending on the mood of my mom. We grew up with inconsistent love. But listen, inconsistent love produces insecure children. Amen. Amen. The reason why some of you are walking around still with insecurity today is because you don't know that you're loved. That God loves you. Amen. Unending. Amen. Unending. Amen. His love is consistent. That's the second thing. His love is different. His love is unconditional. It's not based on your performance. It's not based on what you do or you measuring us. And as human beings, we try to give unconditional love to other people, to our children, to our spouses. But we can't do it all the time because we're imperfect. Right. We cannot love unconditionally all the time. When we grow up with conditional love, we give others. When you say, if I love you if you love me. That's conditional love. We say, I love you because you make me happy. That's conditional love. I love you because you're talented. It's conditional. I love you because anything is conditional love. It's, it's conditional. That's right. Because anything. But God says, I love you, period. No conditions. No, no, no qualifiers, just my grace. You don't ever have to ask, I wonder how God feels about me now because of this. You'll never have to wonder that because of God's grace, you are lovable. Amen. Hallelujah. You are lovable. That's right. God says in Christ, because of his grace, I'm acceptable, I'm valuable, and I'm lovable. And even when I don't feel very lovely, he still loves me. His love is consistent. Number four, the Bible says that because of his grace, I'm forgivable. I'm forgivable. That's a good one because I need that one too. I blow it. I make mistakes, you guys. I need, I need forgiveness. Right. I am forgiven. For a lot of you, you're believers, but anytime something goes wrong in your life, you think, God's getting even at me. You do. You do. You, you, you know, he knows that stupid thing I did and that decision I made and anything goes wrong in your life, you attribute it to God trying to get even or to get revenge on you. Does God really treat his kids that way? No. No. No, he doesn't. Never. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, 25, he says, I'm the God who forgives your sins, and I do this because you deserve it. No, that's not what it says, right? I do this because who I am. It's not based on you deserving it. It's based on God being a forgiving God. Amen. Hallelujah. I will not hold your sins against you, God says. You may want to write, write next to that. God does not carry grudges. God does not carry grudges. He says, I'm not going to hold your sins against you. Some people think God, God is mad at them all the time. I have this friend. He pastors up in Fresno. He has this lady in his church, and, and he tells me she is a liar. He's like, man, this, she's a complainer. Every week she comes to me, and she's, she's complaining about another thing, so she, she'll come every week. Of, oh, Pastor, God convicted me about this in my life. And, oh, every week, week after week, she just says, oh, Pastor, and she just explains the thing that she's feeling bad about that week. And one week, he said, he said, I finally just told her, does God ever tell anything nice to you? So I, I want to ask you, I want to ask you that question. Does God ever tell you anything nice? Does God ever say nice things to you? Some of you, all you hear God saying is not good enough. You did it wrong. You screwed it up. You messed it up. Oh, you're going to get it now. I'm telling you, that's not God. Amen. You're not listening right. to the voice of God. Look at it, Ephesians 1, 4. Through what Christ would do for us, God decided to make us. We didn't make ourselves. He makes us holy in His eyes without a single 
fault. We stand before him covered with his love. What a verse that is. God decided to make us without a single fault before you were ever born. God knew the dumb decisions you would make. He knew the sin you would commit. He knew all that stuff. He made you anyway, redeemed you anyway, loves you anyway. Amen. Forgives you anyway. That's right. Because he's a gracious Father in God. Heaven. Thank you, Lord. Because of God's grace. I'm not only acceptable, valuable, lovable, forgivable, number five. God says that because of his grace, I'm capable. I'm made capable. It's not my training. It's not how much I, I pray and read. Those are good things. Don't get me wrong in this series, please. I just don't want you running to those things. I want you running to the person who gives grace. And through this grace, it will empower you and enable you and give you the ability to do that which you cannot do on your own. Amen. Grace makes me capable. Amen. Philippians 4.13 says, I have strength for all things in this relationship, in, in this person, in this in, in Christ, in Him. I have this strength. He empowers me. And I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through Him who infuses inner strength into me. That is, I am self-sufficient only in Christ's sufficiency. All that grace talk sounds like I can live any way I want, Pastor. What's all this? What's this? What's all this grace off? No, grace doesn't let you off the hook. It changes. It just changes your motivation for what you want to do. Okay. And I want you to realize this, you guys. All these five things—they're they're beautiful truths. Um, they're also not only things that you receive because of grace. Listen, it's so important. I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give you the result. I'm gonna give you the result in a minute. This is so important for you to understand. Not only because of God's grace am I accepted. Not only because of God's grace am I am I valuable, lovable, and capable. But because of God's grace, I am forgiving. Amen. Because of God's grace, I am accepting. Amen. Because of God's grace, I am loving. Because of God's grace, I put value on, on others. You see, you see, if you don't, if you're not living in grace, not only will you be not walking whole as you are acceptable, lovable, forgivable, but if you're not living in grace, you can't give acceptance away. So you'll end up judging people, criticizing people lifting up your nose at other people. You'll end up harboring grudges and bitterness because you can't truly forgive because you're not walking in forgiveness. Amen. So this goes, this living in grace not only goes for what you will receive, but it goes to how you walk in relationship with other people. It empowers you. But it just doesn't, some people, one, one part of the gospel or Paul's letters, he actually, someone asked Paul, he asked a question for himself, it's in Romans, where he says, well, what should we do then? Should we just sin all the more because grace abounds? No, he says. No, that's not, that's not what, what grace is for. I want you to realize this, because all five of these beautiful truths, when you do, listen to me, a miracle takes place. It is an inner work of grace, a miracle, a new man I want to show you one verse, and then I'm going to pick it up right here in one week, next week, in a message that has the power, I'm telling you, to, to change your life. It really does. Don't miss it. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It says, for the grace of God. So there it is. There's the topic of this verse, the grace of God. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It's in His grace. It's, it's, it's in Christ. Through His grace, it offers salvation. Now watch what it says next. It. Well, what's the it? The grace of God. It. The grace of God teaches us. I want to make sure you caught that. That means you, you, you can't just learn. You can't just slap yourself hard enough. You can't just, you know, go to church enough. Oh, I've read ten more chapters of the Bible. Pray a few more hours. No, no, no. That's not what teaches you. Amen. The grace of God is what teaches you. You can do all those things and still miss it and still come up short. And you can work yourself hard enough for a season of doing good, but I promise you, you'll come to the end of yourself at some point and fall back to the same place. It's only through the grace of God. It teaches you. What does it teach you? What does it teach you? It teaches us to say no That's right. to ungodliness and worldly passions. You can't do it yourself. You 
don't work hard, you don't put your, no, grace teaches you to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright. There it is. God, wow, what, I, what I always wanted is this, this relationship with you, God. You just rub off on me so much that I look like you in there. It was in this other tree. It was in this, it was always in freedom. It was never in, in what I could do. It was never in this place of performance, never in this place of duty. It was always in your grace, and through your grace, you would you would do an inner work inside of me, and you would make me like you. I'm teaching that. Really, Pastor, I'll tell you, yes, the grace of God changes you on the inside. So let me give you my definition of grace as we close the service today. And that is grace. Grace is what you ought to do becomes what you want to do. That's the transformation of grace. The grace of God. I want every one of you to have it. Put value hands all across the